Everybody's good, huh? All right. Hey, let's stand up. Let's praise our Lord Jesus. Amen. Ah, how's Lent going for everybody? Oh, I can see it in your eyes. Y'all are doing so good, faithful. <laughs> hey, it's a, it's a walk. It's a progress. Um, but it's our, uh, it's our act of love. It's our act of sacrifice. Um, uh, so during this season, uh, during this season, Jesus, we, um, uh, God, we are reminded of your sacrifice. We are reminded of your love for us. Um, so we thank you so, so much uh, for your grace. Uh, God, how you loved us before we even knew what love was. Um, so help us to worship you uh, in that same thing. Give us, uh, give us breath in our lungs, Jesus. We love you, Father. Be blessed. Sing, there's no space. There's no space that is love can reach. There's no place where we can there's no end to amazing grace. Take me in. Take me in with your arms spread wide. Take me in like an orphan child. Never let go, never leave my side. I am holding on to you. I am holding on to you. In the middle of the storm, I am holding no I am. Or oh, sing love like this, love like this. Oh, my God, to find I am overwhelmed with the joy divine. Love like this sets our hearts on fire. I am holding on to you. I am. We have such a great reason to rejoice, church. Sing, this is my resurrection. This is my resurrection song. This is my hallelujah come. This is why it's to you I run. Sing, this is my resurrection song. This is my resurrection song. This is my hallelujah come. This is why it's to you I run And there's no space that his love can reach There's no place that we can't find peace There's no end to amazing grace I am holding on to you I am holding on to you In the middle of the storm indeed we are holding unto him. Uh, church, it's at this time that we're going to uh, send our little ones over uh, for godly play. Um, let's gather together. Let's say a blessing over them. All little ones, uh, just as you run and you play, may you run to the Father today. Uh, may he reveal himself because it's only in him where we find life and life indeed. So may you find that today. Church, we continue in our worship. Um, we will lift him high. Amen. Though the rest of the world would try to downplay him or discredit him for all the things that he has done and all of his goodness, we will lift him high.
I count on one thing The same God that never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now Been the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all Oh, sing yes I will Oh, yes I will Lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Yeah. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Sing, I count on one thing. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails, will not fail me now, you won't fail me now, and in the waiting, the same God who's never late, is working all things out, working all things out, oh yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my days. Oh, yes, I will. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the of all names that nothing can stand against and I choose to praise to glorify glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against and I choose to praise to glorify glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against and I choose to praise to glorify, glorify the name of all names Then nothing can stand against Oh yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley Yes, I will bless your name Oh yes, I will sing for joy When my heart is heavy Oh my days Oh yes, I Thank you for the cross. Indeed, we look upon it. And we're just overwhelmed by your love. So we sing of it this morning, Father.
that you love and sorrow me. Or thorns come close, so rich a crown. Oh, the you may be seated. We just think about the cross. And we think about what happened three days later. And we're so grateful. Grateful that that stone was rolled away.
Church, would you sing something new with me this morning? Sing about these scarlet sins and the crimson cost. The scarlet sins had a crimson cost. You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was rolled away. Would you sing that with me again? Sing scarlet sins. Scarlet sins had a crimson cost. You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was rolled away. Oh, with joy in your hearts, would you sing? The scarlet sins had a crimson cost. You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross. In empty slate. At the empty grave, thank God that stone was rolled away. Yes, indeed it was. Jesus, we worship you. God, we thank you so much. It is our honor to be able to, uh, to lift you high and to think of your sacrifice and dwell on the life that you gave so that we may have life indeed. We are no longer dead in our sin, no longer with a debt that we couldn't pay. So worship we give you, Jesus. May your name be magnified, God. May it be glorified here. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. May every heart be filled in this place by your Holy Spirit and your holy gift. And Jesus, we remember the prayer that you taught us to pray long ago, and so we say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, we'll just we'll just do this instead. Uh, all right, so our our season uh, of Lent has begun officially last um, on Wednesday. So we actually began our sermon series on Lent um, last week, and and are moving into it with our first Sunday being uh, this week. 
Our, our focus as a church for this season of Lent is on prayer. We're looking at how we as a church can develop a, a, a more robust or expanding our, our prayer life individually, but also collectively as a church and seeking God through prayer together in community. Now, I, I use the word prayer life only because uh, that's how we tend to think of, of our, our prayer life. We tend to think of it in terms of having a prayer life. Um, but I know that Dallas Willard, who's a, a theologian and, and someone who has unknowingly become a mentor to me because I love reading his thoughts on discipleship, um, Dallas Willard has said, uh, we shouldn't call it a prayer, a prayer life. Uh, and the reason is that prayer life assumes that prayer is just a component of our life. That prayer is something that we do, um, that it is, is just something um, that, that's like a box that we can check. You know, I've got a prayer life because I read the Bible, then I say a prayer, I can check the box and move along. Um, he says we should think of prayer as having a praying life. Where prayer isn't a component of our life, it's a part of who we are. It's not a box we check in the morning because we said a prayer and we can go on about our day and then go to our work life and home life and school life. No, a praying life is a life that is fully open to God. It's a spirit about us that says, God, I can call out to you and pray to you at any time in a day. I don't have to just be at home with my Bible. I can cry out to you in the workplace and call upon you and be aware of you wherever I am. And so that's our desire this Lenten season is to develop for us individually a, a praying life and also collectively as a church to grow in a praying life together. Now, I say that and uh, I know as a pastor I have for, uh, gosh, the last um, you know, 15 years had people come to me at, with concerns about their praying life. Uh, and I've heard a number of people say to me things like, I struggle with, with my prayer life. You know, I struggle to pray. I don't know what to pray about. I don't know how to pray. Uh, I feel like my, my prayers are kind of empty. Uh, I, I, I just kind of struggle with prayer. I don't feel like there's power behind my praying. Like often I hear other people pray and I, I get a sense that something's happening with their prayer. And, and chances are at a certain time in your life, you've had those questions regarding your own prayer life. And, and maybe you even have some of those questions now. Well, in this series, we're going to talk about how we can grow in these things. And today, specifically, we're going to talk about the role of the Word of God in bringing clarity, understanding, and power to our praying. But before we move on, I, I want to establish a, a kind of baseline um, when it comes to, to understanding the importance of the Word of God in our praying life. If you don't hear anything else I say today, either because you go to sleep or another battery and a mic goes out, either, either one, uh, if you don't hear another thing that I, I say, I want you to hear this. You cannot have a deep praying life without having an equally deep life in the word. Amen. I don't know who that was back there. I like it. I just want to say the 830 service, that earned four amens. That's killing it for the 830 service. So I expect the same from y'all today. Uh, <laughs> uh, someone's paying attention. I love it. Uh, no, I want us to understand this as a baseline because this is really important. If you're, you're going to engage with this, you cannot have a deep praying life without having an equally deep life in the word. And, and, and whoo, all right. Oh, you give me chills. All right. Holy Spirit, easy today. Okay. <laughs> no, but, but, and you don't have to have a deep understanding of the purpose of the Bible to begin to get this. Because the Bible 
is the means by which God has made himself known to us. The Bible is where God has revealed himself. It's through the scripture that we come to know the heart of God, the character of God. We begin to know the desires of God, the will of God, what the activity of God looks like in our life. You see, apart from the word, you and I are disconnected from all of these things. Without the word, we don't know who God is. Without the word, we're left to guess who God is. And if we're not in the word, then we always run the danger of creating a God of our own making based on our wishes and assumptions. And that's a dangerous game to play. Anytime the people of God in Scripture do that, they begin to venture away from God. So if we want to know who God is, and we have to go to the Word. It's just the basics there for us. The other side of that is, as God is revealed to us through the Word, so the Word teaches us how to pray. Because God is made known through it, And the more we come to know God, the more we are able to pray to God. I mean, think about this in terms of your relationships. Um, In every relationship that you have, the more you come to know about the other person, the easier it is to have conversation. The easier it is for you to communicate. Because you learn the things that they care about. You learn the things not to talk about. A greater knowledge of another person provides more uh, ability for you to dive deeper in connecting with that person and communicating with them. You know, you, you can move past the surface like, boy, the weather's changing out there. Windy today in Midlothian. You know, like you can move past that into deeper things. At least women do this. <laughs> the guys, maybe not as much, but... but But, you know, the knowledge provides a capacity for for deeper relationship and deeper praying. Because we're able then, as we know God, to pray the heart of God, to pray the will of God, to pray according to the character of God and the nature of God. You can't pray to a God you do not know. And for some of us, the first step And expanding our praying life begins with knowing the Lord more deeply. For some of us, the the feeling of anxiety or fruitlessness in our prayers, the fears of spinning our wheels even as we pray, comes because we don't really know who it is we're praying to. And the one thing we have to understand is that you will not have a deep praying life apart from having an equally deep life with God through the word. It's essential. And so how then does the word, how does that help us essentially bring power to our praying well, I don't want to complicate things, but, but let me venture out here a little bit. Um, I, I want to go ahead and say it's not just that you read the Bible that makes a difference in your praying. It's how you read the Bible that makes a difference in your praying life. It's not just that you do it. It's how you do it. And I want to kind of grab this and, and illustrate it for you. Uh, For many of us, we have a a somewhat regular or regular devotional life. And your devotional life looks like this. You come before the Bible. You probably have some kind of resource. You read the Bible passage. Then you read the commentary on the Bible passage, which might be an explanation of the text. Or it might be just some like ooey-gooey story that gives you the feels, you know. Um, depends. There's a lot of different, you know, commentaries out there and what they aim to do. 
Then you say a prayer, and boom, you're out the door. Or boom, you go to sleep, either whether you do your devotions in the morning or the evening. But I wonder how many times have you done your devotional and then like even an hour later for the life of you, you couldn't remember what you read. Nobody. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we can move along. <laughs> okay. Well, for the purposes of this sermon, I'm going to assume that at least at one time this has happened to you. Is that a fair assumption to move on with? Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, and it's happened to all of us, right? Uh, it's happened to every one of us that we've had the same thing take place. We have read the Bible. We did our due diligence. We checked the box, but yet we cannot remember what we read. And this is more common than we tended to kind of express in this, and that's okay. But what that tells us is that something's missing in our practice of reading the Word. And it's Psalm 1 that really brings this out for us as we consider uh, what this means. I'm trying to negotiate. Not easy when you're holding the mic. All right. Um, I want us to look here at Psalm 1 today. We're going to look at verses 1 through 3 if you have your Bible with you. Psalm 1 is going to draw out what we should and how we should read the Scriptures. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not, wis- does not wither for whatever they do prospers. So the psalmist who, who begins the book of Psalms with this, remember this is not written in narrative order. The Psalms were compiled and begins purposefully with Psalm 1 about how to engage the other 149 Psalms that follow. And Psalm 1 says, when we encounter the word of God, that's what the law of God means. It means the entirety of scripture as the psalmist looks at here. Blessed is the one who delights in the law of God, who loves it, who yearns to know the Father more through the word, who doesn't just check the box. But here's where he tips us off into how we're to engage the word. Blessed is he who meditates on the law day and night. You see, for us, this is where many of us are are lacking. We struggle because we we don't meditate truly on the word. And I, I think it's worth our defining what I mean by meditation or what the psalmist more importantly means by meditation here. Because the idea of meditation tends to bring up a couple different images for us. Uh, and, and for most of us, at least me, I tend to think of a, like Buddhist monk meditating, you know, on some mountain in the Himalayas. That's, I don't know, maybe I'm strange, but that's what I think of. And, and this kind of brings to mind that there are really two different kinds of meditation, if you're going to bring it down to two. Uh, one of them is what we call transcendental meditation. This, this kind of meditation is what a Buddhist monk would do. And the purpose of meditation for them is an emptying. It's for them to empty their mind of all thoughts and to empty their hearts of all desire. Because in the Buddhist belief, you want to simply exist as a being, not tied emotionally to any one thing or person. So it is in transcendental meditation and emptying of yourself. You just want to be and nothing else. That is the exact opposite of biblical meditation. In biblical meditation, it is not about emptying your mind or emptying your heart of desires. It's about engaging your mind and engaging your heart. Because you are a being. (laughs) And God has made you a being and desires for you to be a being. 
And God wants to change your being and enter your being. And so scripture, when we begin to meditate, as the psalmist says, is about engaging the way that we think about the world and the way that we think about God. It's about engaging the heart and engaging what we love and our affections and our desires. It's not about emptying of these things. It's about God speaking to our minds and speaking to our hearts. This is where we begin to consider where the word speaks into who we are and speaks specifically not only into, I guess, the general will for all things, but into your life. It's what we do in meditation, biblical meditation. And here's what, why meditation over scripture is so important and how meditation can inform your praying. Meditation makes room for internalization. Meditation on scripture makes room for internalization. And and what I mean by that is we meditate and we consider the word. It gives opportunity for the word to come into our life, to not be something surface level that we read and then dismiss or forget, but to have something that becomes a part of us. And, And that's what Jesus refers to in John chapter 15. As Jesus talks to his disciples about what's going to come and what's going to play out in the coming days, Jesus says, you will remain in me if my words remain in you. You have to remember, Jesus is about to leave them. He's physically been with them for three, three and a half years. And Jesus is about to physically leave the disciples. And yet, the most relational terms he uses for being in relationship with his disciples is used here in John 15 is used for when Jesus will not physically be with them. Jesus doesn't say, you will remain with me as my words remain with you. He says, you will remain in me as my words remain in you. Jesus is saying, they will be a part of you. You see, what remain or abide means in here is to become one with. Jesus is saying, I will be with you and in you as my words are with you and in you. As they become a part of your life, as they become something you wrestle with and stir within, I'll be in you and we'll be in relationship as my words you know, bounce around your heart and have touch points with your life, impact your belief, your values. This is really important um, because meditation on this level uh, of having the internalization is about dwelling upon and resting in the word of God. The image that came to mind to me this week in thinking about this is it's kind of like marinating fajita meat. <laughs> you, you laugh. Like most of my illustrations, I run to food. I don't know. I'll tell you about what, it, what was most important in my life. But uh, but when you're marinating, if you, especially chicken fajita meat, you, you know, there, there's a right way to do it. You make the marinade the night before and you let the chicken sit in it all night long. You don't just dab the chicken in the marinade, do you? And then throw it on the grill. If you do, that's a crime against humanity, all right? Like, that's not not how you do fajita. You let it sit in there because you want the juices. Like, the chicken's a little dense, isn't it? And sometimes we're a little dense, you know? Like, we need to sit and and let the word sit in our life. And there's something beautiful that happens because when we do that and we sit with the word, and it becomes something that we wrestle with, images and themes that come out. Like, then we begin to consider this, and that's when the Holy Spirit begins to move and speak in our life as there's room for the Holy Spirit to speak. It's really important. Internalization creates room. Meditation creates room for internalization of Scripture. And what happens is that this internalization, the process of God speaking through this and opening our eyes to things and the aha moments, 
is that's where you begin praying the word. It's the things that come to light to you and to life to you where you begin praying, God, I'm struggling with this word. Show me what this means. God, it's hard to have self-control. I don't know. I'm struggling in this place in my life. God, step in there and give me the strength. Whatever the word is you encounter, it's as you internalize in that process of wrestling through the word and digesting the word that, man, um, we begin to have something happen. And that begins to be a source of your praying for your life. And it's important because this is what leads to the, the kind of point that the psalmist is making in Psalm 1 and the point Jesus makes in John 15. Both images mirror each other. Internalization paves a way for transformation. So meditation is important. And it's important that we allow the scripture to be internalized because that's what leads the way to transformation. What I mean by transformation is that means that we're changed. It's as something is internalized, that we are inwardly changed in what we believe, in our nature, in what we love, in what we value. Internalization can lead to transformation. That's why the psalmist uses the image of a tree. Blessed is a person who loves the law of God who delights in the law of the Lord and who meditates on it day and night. He says they're like a tree planted by streams of water. What's the next thing that he says? Who yield fruit in its season. He's talking about internalization and transformation. A tree resting by the streams has a constant supply of resource, but a tree isn't a pipe. It doesn't funnel water in and out. A tree takes a resource of water and through the miraculous process of creation, takes that and nourishes the tree and then produces something new and beautiful. That's what the tree does. And I don't have time or the know-how to describe how that happens, but I know it happens. This is the same thing that Jesus talks about when he says, you're just a, vine, a branch existing and tied to the vine. As you're connected and my words remain in you, you will bear much fruit and show yourselves to be my disciples. It's the same thing. It's an inward transformation. Every time scripture talks about transformation, it's not just a transformation of our doing, it's a trans transformation of character of God inwardly making us new. The outward things we do, that flows out of the inward change that God brings. It's internalization, meditation, it's the internalization of scripture that leads to the transformation of you through and through. When you've internalized, you begin to meditate and internalize scripture and wrestle with scripture, pray through scripture. God begins to change you, but that informs your praying. One of the best examples I could find in Scripture of this is Psalm 119.11. I'll end on this. Psalm 119.11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Do you hear it? I've hidden your word in my heart. I've internalized it. It's tucked away so that I won't sin against you, so that my actions will be different. It produces a different kind of living than when I first encountered the word that changed me. If you want to deepen your praying life, then begin with the word of God that reveals the heart of God, the character of God, the nature of God, and the power of God for your praying. We're going to pray, and I'm going to model this for us of how we pray the word, using the word. I'm going to look at Psalm 1, right, and we're going to pray this, and we're going to pray leading into communion, which we have the opportunity to participate in. Let's bow our heads in prayer. your people, 
desire to live lives that honor you. We don't want to be like those whose lives are in step with the wicked or who stand in the company of those who do not love you and have affection for you. We want to be those people who love, Lord, your word because it reveals who you are. It shows us your goodness and your mercy. You're bent to give grace to your children even when we are broken in sin. We pray, God, that you would, through your spirit, stir a desire to know you through the word, to not see our studying of your word to be just an opportunity to check a box. Let's truly have a desire to know you through the word. Be with us as we meditate on your word, day and night. Let it stay with us. Let your spirit keep the word in front of us and as the role of the Holy Spirit to teach us and inform us of all things and to hold Christ before us, let that word begin to stir something within. Let it challenge us and let it change us. Let us bring our deficiencies before you through the word and what it reveals about us. And we pray that the word would not only be set upon our hearts, but God, that you would produce fruit, that we would be like that tree planted by streams of water producing fruit for you and for your kingdom because we love you and we so want to honor you. We want our lives to prosper not only for our sake, but for your sake, Lord, because we so love you. Pray, God, as we come before this table, that we might be reminded of all that Christ has done for us. Of our invitation to come to this table and to bless your holy name. We pray that God, you would meet us here as we draw near to you. And we pray all of this in the mighty name of our Savior in whom we call Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, sitting there before his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body, my body which is broken for you. So great is my love for you, my mercy, my grace, that my body is broken so that you through me might live. He also in that same meal took the cup and said, this is a cup of being in a new relationship with God and a new way in which you relationship, not through righteousness to the law, not through your earning favor in any way, but simply by your coming to me, for as my blood has been shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And he invited us just like the bread to take. This is the invitation of Christ for all to come to the table and draw life from him. And so our prayers that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on these gifts, that they would be for us the body and blood of Christ. That as we take them, we might be empowered to truly be the people of Christ. In every way, those trees planted by the streams of water, producing fruit as an expression of our love for Christ. I'm going to ask those who are assisting with communion to go ahead and come forward. take the elements here and this is a united methodist table which means that if you're here you're invited to take these gifts it's not a privilege or a, a it is a privilege it's not a, a something we give just for our members but for all of us um, we're going to come and invite you to come you can come down the kind of rows over here or through the middle row you'll come and receive this and there's going to be an option for you to come and pray or stand around the prayer rail We'll invite you to do that. Um, we, our bishop has asked that we take up an offering for those in the Ukraine, the refugees and orphans. So if you want to make a gift, you can leave it at the altar or just around the altar. We'll make sure to get it um, and make sure it goes toward that cause. Um, but this is an opportunity for us to come and respond. May you feel a freedom to come and pray and seek God 
um, at the altar, the place where God meets us. So uh, we invite you to come and receive this gift of God's grace for us.
Church, would you stand and sing with us? Cry out to him, abide with me. Abide with me. Abide with me. Don't let a couple of quick announcements. Uh, one of those is that in this season of Lent where we're seeking to draw nearer to God in prayer, not only individually, but as a church, we have an opportunity on Wednesday night for our prayer service at seven o'clock. We'll be guiding you through prayer and deeper praying together as a church. It's going to be a great experience. Uh, so I invite you to be a part of that. Uh, we also have on an individual, but also kind of collective level, uh, we have uh, these cards. If you have not received one yet, uh, this is just a card to be able to pray for our church. We're joining together every day of the week. There's a specific prayer to pray for our church. And so I want you to be participating in this. If you're a first-time guest with us, take one. We'd love for you to join us in praying. Uh, it's just a great way for us as a church to draw together even when we can't be physically together. Uh, we have just really kind of one other date to be mindful of. And the last weekend in, in March, the 26th and 27th, we'll have kind of a work day. You notice we got the house over there demoed, and we want to open up our land and clear it out a little bit. So if you can be here and think about that weekend, we'll provide some time pretty quickly uh, to, for you to be here to help us out with that. Uh, but we're excited about it. Um, I want to thank you for being here. If you're a first-time guest, Miss Shannon has a gift for you, a T-shirt we'd love to bless you with. Uh, just say thank you for showing up with us today. And we're glad to have you. Uh, but we leave this place. We know that the opportunity to worship continues, and we get to give our gifts to God. There are places to give as we exit this place to be mindful of this God who's given to us, and so that worship continues. Um, but we also leave this place with confidence in a God who desires to know us and has made himself known to us through the word. My prayer is if you want to grow and expand your praying life, that you look to the word to guide you deeper, uh, to know the heart of God, to seek the heart of God and the will of God in your life. 
um, and may that go with us. Um, I realize right before I uh, release you, um, we have two people who want to join our church today. So if you can hold on for just a few moments, Steve and Jackie, I'll, I'll call you all down. So almost forgot, almost forgot, and I hung on there to the last one I know. Clearly the morning Starbucks is wearing off. So this is Steve and Jackie Colton. We're so glad to have y'all transferring your membership here and have been with us for a while. And we're so glad you're officially joining to be a part of our life together as a church. And so I'm going to ask you the questions of membership. Will you support our church with your prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness? And Will, that's a good answer. All right. Well, we're so glad. Oh, and to officially have y'all as a part of the church. Can we say a prayer over y'all in just this, this moment? Um, God, we are so excited to have Steve and Jackie be a part of our life. We're so thankful that you've called them here, that, God, you've given them gifts and graces, that you are alive in them, and that, God, they're going to contribute to our life together as a church as we seek to live out the calling of Christ upon the church, to reach people for Christ and to make disciples. We're so excited for them. We pray that the church, as they're welcomed in as family, would be a blessing to them in their life. We're so thankful for this opportunity. We look forward to the ways in which you will move. We give you thanks for this day and celebrate all that you're doing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to have you all stand here. Um, Renee, if you can come up here so they're not standing alone when I walk off to catch people who are walking out. Um, but just come by and say, say hi to Steve and Jackie and welcome them into the church. You know, church, we get to go from this place. Man, may God meet us in the word and in our praying this week. Amen.